Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming out this afternoon to this is our last offering in the 13-14 uh, Arctic Speaker Series. Uh, usually it's the executive director who does the introductions for the speakers, but given that they're the same person, uh, I got the honor today to introduce Dr. Mary Beth Murray. And she is going to, uh, she came to us when, August? last yeah, August, yeah. and uh, we call her our Arctic hair energizer. <laughs> so she has really, um, I guess, speeded things up at the Institute, which is wonderful. And uh, she's going to tell us today about her vision for the Arctic Institute um, as we move forward. So without any further ado, Mary Beth. You don't need to. No. Thanks, Karen. So is this sound? I don't, I don't know how probably not going to be that exciting compared to some of the other talks we've had this year. But, and I would say that this is just not my vision. This is our, I hope, it's our vision. And when we come back to the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, how we got to where we are. But I'm not going to do that at the front end because I just want to get going. So I have to put my glasses on here. And I should say that um, I'm in the process now of turning this into an actual document, which we'll have available that for a general comment for a month or so and then we'll that'll be it that'll be printed and that'll be it and <laughs> we'll go on so um, right so when I um, started thinking about um, what what we could do with the Arctic Institute I sort of situated that in the context of some of the things that I've been doing for a long time and how I think about the North and the Arctic which is as a really dynamic place a, comp a compelling place a place where change is constant um, and for people who live there life is challenging and rewarding and for those of you who've spent any great amount of time in the north um, I think you can probably relate to that um, I lived in Alaska for 14 years before I came to Calgary and before that I worked um, all over Nunavut territory and so um, but I didn't live there but I spent a lot of my summers up there so I I have a sort of a personal connection I think and feelings about the North and, and what we should try and be doing through our institute to advance um, not only what we do here in Calgary, I almost said the lower 48, that shows you how long I've been in Alaska, <laughs> what we do here in, in the rest of Canada um, and how we can help um, Northerners um, achieve some of the things that they hope to achieve, whether that's in art or science or culture or, or as the case may be. So am I going to get this right, Melanie? Obviously not. No, I think I have to use it up here because I have my cheat notes on the thing. So when we started thinking about how to build the next uh, phase of life of the Institute, we had some things that we wanted to consider. Um, first and foremost, you know, what, what is it we do? What's our mission as an Institute? Who are we doing it for? Um, what are we really good at? Where do we want to be? What's our vision? And I, I did feel that our vision needed a little updating since it was originally articulated in 1945 and the world has changed somewhat since then. Um, and uh, what are our goals and how will we reach our goals? What's the strategy for getting there? So for those of you who don't know, the Arctic Institute, as I mentioned, was created in 1945 by an, a, an act of Canadian Parliament. Um, and so we are a federally incorporated nonprofit a multidisciplinary institute that is also formally affiliated with the University of Calgary. We used to be part of McGill University, but in 1976 moved from um, uh, Quebec to Alberta. Um, we're a membership institute, which means anyone can join and belong. And um, we have a very broad, broad mandate, which has not changed since we were originally incorporated. And this is our mission statement. So it's huge, right? This is a huge mission <laughs> to advance the study of the North American and circumpolar Arctic through every possible means uh, of, of science and social science, art, humanities, preserve and disseminate information on all aspects of the North, physical, environmental, social. So I mean, this is about as big of a mandate or mission as you can, as you can have for an institute. And that is great because that gives us lots of different and creative ways to try and fulfill this mission. So what is it we really want to do? I mean, what, what, is, what is the vision we have? And this is not, uh, and I, I think our vision, this is what our vision should be, but I'm open to suggestions. 
I think as an institute, what we should be trying to do through all kinds of different mechanisms, some of which I'll talk about today, is advance knowledge for a changing North. We know that the North is going to keep changing. Um, and how can, we, how can we provide information about that and help people who live there and help people who are connected to the North, whether they live uh, there or somewhere else? So this is how we fulfill our mandate today. And most of you, or many of you, will be fam familiar with um, this. Can I make this work? Yay! So here's, it. here's our institute. And we have a number of different um, parts of the institute that function to fulfill different parts of our mandate. So we'll start down here with the Kluwani Lake Research Station. This is a field research station that we have in Yukon Territory, a couple hours west of Whitehorse. And all kinds of typical northern research goes on here. A lot of ecology, glaciology, environmental studies. Um, in the past, we've had archaeological research done out of our station, some cultural anthropology. So all the things that you might expect to see at a northern research station. And our station has been operational for uh, just over 50 years. So we are one of the longest running research stations in northern Canada with a, a very nice um, record of scientific activity. So that's kind of like a basic research component. Um, one of the other ways we fulfill our mandate to disseminate information about the north is through our journal Arctic, which has been published continuously since 19, 1948. So that makes Arctic one of the oldest, um, most well-respected interdisciplinary research journals about the north in the world, if, and I would say, it is the best one. Um, so Arctic is a really important piece of what we do because this is how we get scientific information out to a broad audience. Another way we fulfill our mandate is through ASTIS, the Arctic Science and Technology Information System. And that really is a window into not just research activities that have been conducted in the North, but also a lot of work that's been done by the private sector in, with respect to things like development and their reports that they've produced over the years. And anybody can get into ASTIS and see what's out there on a partic particular topic. And this is a great service that we provide free to anybody who's interested in accessing bibliographic and publication information about, about the Arctic. Very strong for Canada and um, growing for Alaska. And I would hope that someday we would have a really strong circumpolar set of holdings there. And then we have our library and our archives and our art collection. And we have one of the best polar libraries in Canada, if not the world, maybe with one or two possible exceptions. And um, that's, of course, available and accessible to anybody who can get into the library and take a look at it. And none of these things would be possible without these people, who I'll come back to at the end, because they are a really important part of how we accomplish what we're doing now and what we want to do in the future. So when I was hired, and I was told by the Vice President of Research, for whom I work directly, <laughs> and the Board of Directors, that we really needed to think about our institutional goals. And, and I agree with that. What, what, where do we want to go? How do we want to get there? And so after a lot of discussion with people, um, um, a lot of consultation, not just here at the university, but publicly and around the country and internationally, we've sort of come up with these three institutional goals. And I would say they're quite lofty, but why not, right? Aim high, start small, go forward, um, as one of our research associates said to me the other day, or something like that. So really, where would I like us to be in five years, ten years from now? I'd like us to be the leading institution in this country for integrating Arctic and Northern research with education and public engagement. I want us to be a place that offers unique opportunities for um, discovery, creativity, um, innovation and research that benefits northern peoples and all Canadians. And I'll come back to some examples of what we're already doing in, in this way and, and where I'd like to see us head. And finally, that I think our institution should be sitting at the forefront of meeting needs for information and enabling the transfer of knowledge, scientific knowledge, for problem solving and decision making in the north. And if we can accomplish even two of these things, we'll have really will really have done something. And I don't see why we can't accomplish all three. And when I did present a draft, I should say, when I did present a draft of this to, to somebody in higher administration, they said, wow, well, you could just go for Western Canada. And I thought, forget it. You know, like, we should be right out front. We're the oldest. We're venerable. Why not be leaders? 
So at the end result of our, uh, sort of our discussions and our consultation process and many different presentations that I've given over the past six months or seven months, We've sort of come up with a new model for integration at our institute. In the past, our, 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 our different sections that, that I showed you, like Astis and our journal and our station, have kind of operated separately. And I really see us as, a, as an integrated place where we all work together to advance our goals and, our, and our, our accomplish our mission. And so what we have here uh, is sort of um, building an institute that's focused on three thematic areas, the dynamic north, an Arctic Synthesis Center, and I'll talk about each one of these in turn, and um, a, 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 an area that looks at energy innovation and northern sustainability. And I should say that um, our focal areas here align with the priorities that I saw coming out of the public consultation and discussions we had, and they also align really well with the strategic priorities for the University of Calgary, and I think that that's an important thing um, for everybody to keep in mind is that w we should be somehow aligning with the institution that provides us with our operational funds and in the hope that uh, we can grow those operational <laughs> funds in the future. And um, so, so I've, I've tried hard to make sure that we, we meet our institutional goals, but that we also are complementary to the institution that, that, that holds us, which is the university. So we can just talk, I'd just like to talk about these areas a little bit um, in a little bit more detail. So if we think about the North, you know, the Arctic Institute has always provided a window on northern science and art and culture. And we've done this, as I mentioned, through our research activities, through our research associates, through the students that we've supported over the years, through our publications, and through our archival and art collections. And it is important to me. Uh, as director that we continue to support all different aspects of uh, northern research and, and northern engagement, and that includes the arts and, and culture as well as sciences. And I, I, I mention this now because some of the things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes are focused more on the sciences, but I want everyone to understand that I see all these things as equally important, just having implementation of certain activities occurring at different times. So. It's, it's my goal, I think, uh, as we move into the future, to sort of bring the dynamic north home to all Canadians through um, different kinds of opportunities, whether those are in natural science or social science research or whether they're in the arts and humanities. And what I really want to try and do is enable students and the general public to participate in research activities that run out of our institute, as well um, learn how to use new technologies that are related to um, research in the north, and also, um, in partnership with northern people, develop um, research activities and exchange programs that bring northerners south and southerners north. And I think uh, a major goal for us here in this sort of focus area is bringing our historic archives and our art collections um, and our research facilities at our research station to the widest possible audience. And I don't just mean academics, I mean everybody from school children to um, the government. Okay, um, for our second thematic area, um, energy innovation and northern sustainability, it's really clear that if we're at the University of Calgary and we don't have something to say about energy and northern development, then we're not going to be relevant to what's going on at this institution. And how we say that and what we do in that area is really something that I think we're, wide, we're free to choose. So I see our institute and I think a lot of our research fellows and our board see this as an opportunity for us to actually act as a facilitator for ethical, appropriate, and conscientious northern development. And I see our institute focusing, uh, sitting as a partner for developing energy solutions for northern communities and particularly cold climate energy research and sustainability. So I'm going to come back to this in some detail, but I, I want to make it clear that I think we have a couple of different roles to play here as an institute. One is as an honest broker of information between private sector development and people who live in the north, and one is as an actively engaged in, in research itself on solutions for sustainability in the north. And finally, um, the fourth thematic area, 
or the third, God, don't, I don't want four, three's enough, <laughs> is um, something that, for lack of a better term, I'm thinking of as an Arctic Synthesis Center. And really, I would like to see our institute grow to be a place where scholars from around the world come to address specific problems in Arctic systems research. For example, what is the relationship between ocean ice and atmosphere in the north and how that's changing and how that's affecting the global, global atmospheric circulation. I just make that up as an example. But I really would like us to see it to, uh, us to grow to become a nexus for engaging scientists and social scientists in addressing real problems that face the scientific community. Um, and, to, and to use that opportunity to then um, address local needs in the north, um, in Canada or elsewhere. So what I'm thinking of is seeing the institute function as a place for scholar exchange and a think tank for addressing some of the key problems that have been identified by uh, the northern research community. So that's great. We have these big goals. We have some thematic focus areas. Um, we have a vision. All that's good. How, how are we going to implement this? How are we going to make this happen? And I see a number of different mechanisms for, for, for doing this. Um, not necessarily in any particular order of importance, just the order in which I'm going to discuss them. The first is through research programs that are led out of the Arctic Institute. The second is through our research support services. The third is through our data and information services. The fourth is through functioning as a communications outlet. The fifth is through a really strong and ex exciting and ongoing kindergarten through grade 12 and public outreach and education program. And the, and the last is by taking leadership in new collaborative initiatives and new ideas. I think it's time for the Institute to step up to the plate and say, here is something that we think is important. Who wants to work on this with us and go forward? And I see that nationally and both and, and internationally. So what I what I want to do now is talk about some initiatives that we've got going in each of these areas, things that are already underway, things that are in the planning stages, and things that I would like and we all hope will see will happen in the coming years. So these are just a few examples. Right now, the Institute is directly involved in, as a full partner in three major research initiatives. The first is an auroral geospace observatory, and I'll talk about that. The second is um, building a research station of the future. And the third is a, a project that I'm calling the social, scientific, and environmental impacts of community-based monitoring in the north. Um, we have a, a large number of research associates, uh, many of whom are engaged in work that is directly relevant to um, the things that I'm talking about here, and, and um, I'll talk about the research associates a little bit. And then I want to talk about our planned research activity, which I, we're thinking of as a virtual institute for the study of northern art, culture, and literature. How do we open up our holdings to a wide audience so that they can actually conduct research um, from a distance if they can't necessarily come here. So right, so this first project, the Aurora Geospace Observatory, this is a totally new area for us at the Arctic Institute. We've partnered with Eric Donovan and Emma Spanswick in the space physics department here at the University of Calgary. There are many other partners on this project, um, including Astronomy North in Yellowknife, which has the Aurora Max display. And this project is funded uh, very healthily by the Canadian Space Agency. And where the Arctic Institute fits in is, is that we have built this as a citizen science project. So the space physics department has their interest in the aurora borealis and how the aurora affects um, space weather and how space weather affects weather on Earth. But at the Arctic Institute, our interest is in how can we engage people in the science that's being done to understand the aurora. And you know, the aurora is really um, it's the aurora borealis is such a feature of northern life. If you read um, uh, northern literature, if you learn about northern cultures, the aurora plays a fundamental role in, in how people see the landscape, the world that they live in. And so we're building a program that would allow anybody who's interested in the aurora borealis to participate in this research through um, web-based um, 
software that allows people to learn about ways that the aurora is classified, to then become active and engaged in classifying the aurora themselves, and then have their work contribute to um, how physicists understand the North. And I see this developing over the longer term with a companion piece in our virtual institute that would have um, myths and stories and legends about the aurora that would have a, a whole other arts and humanities side to it. But this is where we are with it right now. So this project was recently funded. We're in the process of hiring a postdoctoral fellow who will sit at the Arctic Institute that will work on public engagement and involving schools. Um, we've partnered with the Calgary Schools so that we hope we can start to build this into the, some, of, some of the science curriculum. So that's, that's one example. And we see this as a very long-term partnership with the space physics department and um, bringing um, really new opportunities for, for research and funding to, uh, to, to the Arctic Institute um, and educational opportunities. And something that I, ho I hope will bring a wider audience to know about our institute. Because as it turns out, Aurora Borealis watching is a global tourism phenomena. Um, and so we, we really um, see this as a kind of an exciting new area for us. I don't imagine that this will ever become the focal point of what we do at the institute, but I s a, a nice companion piece for all the other things that we do. The other major research project that, that I've, I've started with um, support from the um, VP Research's office who provided me with a new initiatives fund is turning our research station at Kluwani Lake into the research station of the future. And so in addition to providing research services for other scientists, we are hoping that we can turn our, inst our, our research station into a model of off-grid sustainability and a place where researchers can come and try out new experimental kinds of off-grid energy solutions. And so we've started a project this summer with David Wood and Andy Knight and Ed Nowicki in the engineering department. All three of these guys are involved in the development of off-grid energy solutions from solar to wind to geothermal. And, um, we are actually going up to our station at the end of April and we're going to instrument it to see how we use our energy up there, monitor where it's used, do an assessment of the possibility of integrating renewables into the station. Um, we're going to monitor that for a whole year. The data that comes out of our station monitoring is going to be used in educational programs in the engineering department here and at the University of Alberta. And we are, have also started discussion with local stakeholders in Yukon, like Yukon Wind and KFN, uh, Kiwani First Nations, about what we might do at our station to do experimental work that could help them. So KFN, the First Nation, has started a wind power project. Um, Ashak Cham Champaign Ashak is interested. And we would like to see Kluwani as a place where um, scientists who are involved in developing these kind of technologies can come and test them out t 12 months a year and experiment with solving problems of off-grid um, energy use in a cold, dark place. The other thing that we're starting is an experimental program in high-latitude horticulture and some, I hope, will evolve into some agricultural experimentation. So this summer we're going to build a greenhouse at the station, which we will use for food, but also we hope to work with Yukon College and engage students from Yukon College in doing some experimental um, uh, horticultural research. So we'll put a first greenhouse in this summer, and I hope by 2015, 2016, we'll have two more. So one we can use to supply our station, and two that can be used for basic research. So this to me is something that I think we can do with respect to sustainability and energy in the North that is consistent with, I think, what uh, our, our institutional goals, um, but also brings opportunities for completely new kinds of research into our station. So we have something going on um, in addition to the, all the ground squirrel work and the basic ecology and, and um, uh, glaciology that's been happening for 50 years. Right, and this, then this is another major funded project that we're starting spinning up this year. And this actually grew out of some work that I started in Alaska and brought here with me. But I think it's a very important piece for our institute. Around the Arctic, and in the Canadian Arctic in particular, 
certainly in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been increasing engagement of northern people in uh, research activities and particularly in environmental monitoring. Um, everything from water quality to animal health um, to um, ice thickness, things like that. Um, I feel that our research station at Kluwani should be engaged in partnering with the First Nations in that community in a community-based environmental monitoring program if that's what people there would like to do. But in order to do that, I really think it's time we had a, a pan-Arctic assessment of how effective these programs are. And so we are taking a, a couple of years um, to, to, first of all, look at this, ways in which local knowledge and need for information are harnessed to scientific inquiry so we can understand what's happening in the Arctic, how communities have adopted or not adopted new technologies for their monitoring programs and how effective those are. And um, this project is actually great because it's, it's an international project. So we have support from the state of Alaska through the Arctic Landscape Conservation Cooperative. We have support from Environment Canada to look at some of the aspects of developing monitoring programs in communities at research stations. I'm not supposed to talk about the third one, but I am going to. We have a project that's been funded. We're not supposed to talk about it quite yet. But we have a project that's been funded to develop a, a cyber infrastructure that would feed into this research. And we're hiring a postdoctoral fellow to work with stakeholders as we develop that program. And then we have a, a PhD fellowship that we're recruiting a student for right now that will actually work in Alaska and Canada with different communities that are involved in these community-based monitoring programs and do some of the assessments and recommendations for how these can be better developed. So with these three projects that I've, uh, that I've sort of outlined, I hope you get a sense of how I try to, I'm trying to position our institute to take on um, leadership in certain areas that are consistent with, with what I see as the important thematic areas. Um, right, so I want to talk a little bit about the research associates. We have a very large number of research associates at the Arctic Institute. Quite a few of them are sitting in this room now and will have heard some of this before. I really hope that we can more actively engage research, in, research associates in our developing projects. So while many have their own um, projects that they're engaged in, independent and are affiliated with us, it's my goal to better integrate the, in, the RAs into the institute and into our specific activities. Um, we really need to raise the profile of our active research associates. You'll see I have a little house cleaning down there. We have quite a number of research associates that are not active and there's a little dusting that needs to be done. But for the ones that are active and who will contribute to our, our goal and fulfilling our mandate, we really want to raise their profile by having real space for them on our website so they can highlight what they do um, and, and, and why, why that is consistent with being a research associate at the Arctic Institute. We're going to try and offer up lots of new opportunities for the research associates to engage. So we're working now on developing a calendar of education and outreach activities that we hope the RAs will participate in. Um, we, we would like to develop a directory so that we can match our RAs um, with people who are seeking information or help in certain areas. So that's matching requests for information, which we get all the time with the research expertise of our RAs. And we're going to start a lunch and learn program. And actually, we were kind of hoping we'd get that going this spring. I don't know if we will. And we would like to engage the research associates in that, because they do cover a really broad spectrum of activities um, and studies of the North, from, from arts and literature and history to wildlife biology, archaeology, um, and um, yeah, space physics. <laughs> OK. So that's sort of how I, that's sort of how we're trying to map out a direction for actual research within the institute. But one of the other ways we fulfill our mandate is through research support. And I, I want to talk about what we're doing with research support right now and where we'd like to take it in the coming four or five years. So we have the Kluwani Lake Research Station, as I mentioned. We can accommodate between 30 and 40 researchers there at any one point in time. We provide them with room and board. And it's nice, beautiful, actually incredibly beautiful environment. We have some basic lab facilities, wet and dry lab. Um, we have some really cold, cold freezers for people that like to freeze brains and things like that. Not human brains. 
Um, we have an airstrip, which is great, which means we can, we can facilitate getting scientists out onto the glacier um, and other remote field locations, whether that's through a fixed wing aircraft or helicopter, and we uh, have access to both of those forms of transportation. And for many years now, we've had um, satellite um, internet service. Uh, when Benoit Beauchamp was the director, he was successful, was very successful in getting funding to grow the infrastructure at our station. And so as a result of that, we do have these new lab facilities, we have new bathroom facilities, we have a beautiful mess hall. And I want to build on um, what Benoit did and expand our facilities. So we're starting that process this year, first by installing some basic instrumentation at the station that we hope will attract new researchers, but also will facilitate the work that's already going on there. And that is, um, we're putting in a satellite navigation system that with um, GPS and GNS service, GNSS service, and that is a, a very sophisticated system that can be used by everything from solid earth geophysicists to uh, atmospheric scientists to people who are out in the field and don't want to get lost. We want to increase our ability to provide scientific support and field support and we're starting that this summer by first of all offering basic instruction in how to use GPS to students and researchers that come to our station that don't know how to use it. It's our goal to also offer, offer, some, offer some more formal safety training and we hope that we can offer this not just to the people that work out of our station, but to the surrounding communities. So we want to work with KFN to offer GPS instruction to people who are interested in it, um, to Yukon College, whatever. And so to make that happen, I made a big financial decision <laughs> and we're actually hiring some scientific staff for the station starting in May of this year. And I'll come back and talk about that, but we'll have a, um, a, a pretty much a full-time scientist at the station this summer and hopefully um, after this year that will be a permanent position. We also are moving into managing the metadata that comes out of our research station. So we're looking at implementing national and international standards for metadata collection so that we can make information about the science that's done at our station publicly available. Right now we don't do that and that means we're a little bit out of sync with what's happening in the rest of Canada and around the world. And we'll also be um, linking this metadata to our new geospatial platform that I'll be talking about later so that we can provide our scientists not only with up-to-date field uh, safety and um, basic research equipment, but we can make their research more publicly accessible. Ultimately, we would like to see a winter research capability at the station, and that's going to require a lot of money and a lot of new initiatives. And that's one of the reasons why I think pursuing some of the energy sustainability research opens up a window to new opportunities for funding. It w if, if we can pull that together and get that happening at our station, we'll be the only research station in northern Canada that has an active energy research program of that sort. And that would make us unique. And as I've come to discover, if you're not unique, you're not good enough. <laughs> so. Uh, so I'm trying to see how all of these fit together. And we hope that we will be positioned, if not next fall, certainly by, 20, by 2015, to put in some major proposals to build new winter-capable research facility at the station. Right now we operate April through September, October. Um, Right. Other ways that we're supporting research through the Arctic Institute. We are a member of an international network of Arctic research stations called Interact. And this year, for the first time, we're opening up our research station to international partners through a funding program where we're providing support to bring researchers into the station who might not ordinarily be able to come. And the first researcher that's coming this year is um, Pateri Alho from the Acad Research Academy of Finland. And he has a pan-Arctic uh, program of research on uh, river flow and river discharge. And he's going to bring that program to the research station and take a look at the rivers that are flowing into Kluwani Lake and develop a partner program, we hope. And that'll be our first real hydrological study at the station. And we hope next year we'll have another scientist from somewhere else in the world. We do have international scientists that come all the time. But this is actually a formal program of scientist exchange with um, about 
17 other countries and 16 other research stations. So we see this as a way of supporting um, research, not just nationally, but internationally. Um, other kinds of research support. We will be, bring, it, it's my goal to start to see the Arctic Institute function as a hub for some of the many different secretariats that are out there for Arctic activities. So some of you might be familiar with the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, which is managed out of the University of Tromso. Um, there's the Climate and Cryosphere Program Office, which is also managed out of the University of Tromso. And there, Tromso manages about two other big Arctic international programs. And I, I would like to see ANA become a hub for doing that as well in Canada. And those secretarial um, offices often move around from location to location. So this year we'll bring the first one here, which is the International Study of Arctic Change. Um, and we will have, I hope, some staff in place for, the, for that program office um, by September. And uh, then we will be the Canadian partner for this program. There's a Swedish partner in Stockholm and a Chinese partner in Qingdao. And this is really important because the International Study of Arctic Change is a direct connection for us to the Arctic, the broad Arctic research community. And ISAC is responsible for organizing every two years a huge Arctic observing summit that brings scientists, governments, private sector groups together to talk about and discuss ways of improving how we collect observational information on the Arctic for everything from uh, uh, atmospheric observations to sea ice information for safety and shipping. And if we can, if we can support that office through ANA, and then that gives us a very prominent role in one of the what, what is growing to be one of the biggest international um, collaborative Arctic activities that are out there. And just for those of you who might be interested in this, I should say that the Arctic Observing Summit, which ISAC coordinates and puts together, is, a, is an Arctic Council-related activity. So there are some other reasons for doing this just beyond um, sheer interest. And finally, other ways that we can support research activities would be through our data and information services. And we are in the process now, we're just spinning this up, of building what we're calling our Arctic Connect program. And this will allow us to realize geospatial information for all of the data that we hold in our institute now, beginning with ASTIS uh, holdings, but moving on towards our other collections. It will allow us to display the information that comes out of the Kuwani Lake Research Station in a geospatial format. Um, we're working with Steve Liang in the Geosensor Web Lab here at the university to develop a, a, a network system that can pull in environmental sensor data and turn that data into something that anybody can understand and use and access through the internet through our institute. And our community-based monitoring initiatives and our citizen science through the Aurora Project will all also flow through Arctic Connect. So we can provide um, basic research, but also basic data for research, but also information for a, generally, for a general public. And we have a post office associated with this position, which we're recruiting for right now. So if you know a smart person that might be interested in working on engagement and helping us develop this, send them our way. Okay. We also deliver our mandate through communications, and we have a number of really solid communications outlets. I mentioned Arctic already, that's obvious. I mentioned Info North, we have the Northern Lights publication series. But we are looking for new ways to communicate information about the North. We have some funding now to produce publications from the Arctic Observing Summit. We're going to start with a special issue of Arctic that should hopefully, well hopefully, will come out sometime in the next 12 months. But because the AOS is a regularly, regularly occurring activity and there's regularly financial support to produce the publications, we see this as a new outlet of information from the Arctic Institute that's paid for, which is great. We're putting to get, we ha we're started and we really need to finish this up soon, putting out new informational packages about our institute and our services and our research activities. Arctic Connect, which I mentioned, and we've re are redesigning and we'll be launching a new website soon. I think the major thing here is that to really do this well, we need another staff person. We need somebody who's charged with com public communication, education, and outreach. And that is um, 
a goal of mine is to, is to raise our operating budget to the point where we can have somebody who does this work full time. Because without it, we're all picking up the small the pieces along the way, and that's not an effective strategy. So our new website is scheduled to be launched April 1. Maybe we should do it April 2, right? <laughs> Um, and we're really, really excited about this. Um, it, it will have everything that we've always had, but a whole bunch more. Um, so through the website, we're gonna, we hope we can facilitate and improve people's access to our resources. You'll be able to watch lectures like this one if you're so inclined. <laughs> um, because our website will be connected up to our citizen science and public engagement activities, the people can go through our site to participate in research. Um, and some basic things that we've needed to do for a long time. You'll be able to renew your membership online. Yay, that's great. You'll be able to book space at our research station online and pay for it online. And you can buy a t-shirt if you want to. And we also want to see this as a place where people can find Arctic opportunities, northern opportunities, whether those student opportunities for summer jobs or research and fellowships, um, opportunities to participate in research activities, opportunities to um, participate in some of our public education outreach. So I think we're all really excited about this. I'm excited about it. So, um, And Melanie has been working very, very hard to make that happen, as so has everyone else. So quickly, um, I want to talk about how some of these, these things have are coming together so that we're improving our engagement at a number of different levels, first at the university and then more broadly. So I mentioned our projects that we now have with engineering and space physics and a developing program with Faculty of Arts. And certainly engineering and space physics are two completely new partnerships for us. And I think that that's great. Um, we're trying hard to engage the student body in the activities of the institute. So we'll be having a PhD student who will sit in a home department, but also be a member of the Arctic Institute, a, stu a research student at the Institute. We're hiring three eyes high postdocs in the next 12 months. We're hiring our Arctic Connect postdoc right now. And we have for many years, as many of you know, supported the Northern Scientific Training Program um, through the university. And I think it's time that we have an NSTP student speaker series. And so our first thing we will do in the fall for our Arctic speaker series is invite the students who were awarded NSTP money to come and we'll have a longer than normal um, public lecture and everybody will get 15 minutes to talk about the research they did this summer and then we'll have some festivities after that. And I would like to see more of these kinds of student activities led out of our institute. We've tried hard to engage with the university, and the, I mentioned this earlier, that the energy research theme is, is a pretty natural fit, given some of the things that have been done over the years with ASTIS and where we'd like to take our station. And in fact, we'll be, um, I'll be leading um, a seminar or a workshop next fall on the cumulative impacts of energy development in the Arctic, which is coming out of the Vice President of Research Office, and that will be an, an ANA kind of led and facilitated activity. Um, we have some plans about things we think we need to do and just here at the university, but I think the most, the one that, that I really want to see happen is this one right here. I would like to see us have an endowed chair or a visiting research professor position sitting in our institute. And that's something that um, I'll be working with our board of directors and university administration to cr try and raise sufficient money so that we have some kind of endowment. And ideally, I see that as sort of a rolling focus area where we might bring somebody in for a year um, as a visiting professor in some component of Arctic science one year, and maybe the next year somebody from the arts and humanities. And so that, to me, is, is one way we can really put ourselves on the map. We have three new student scholarships of slash fellowships that we'd hope to have mobilized by next year this time. So that would bring our total up to like nine? A lot, a lot. And um, I, some of these, um, I would say that at least one of these will be focused on supporting students who want to do research, ANA-based research, whether that's at our station or using our collections and our archives. Um, I, that is important to me. Um, and I don't know about the third one. That's up for negotiation. 
Um, I would like to see an intern program developed at our institute, um, and that requires some, some th thinking, but I think we could do that. And then we've has, I've started to have discussions with some people in the vet med school about how we might partner on some research activities. So that would broaden our, our engagement even further. And again, um, I think also with the visual and the digital arts community. I'm really going on, aren't I? Right, so K through 12, some of the things we have on the go. We just uh, actually yesterday got our memorandum of um, understanding from Telespark, and we're starting a regular program of collaboration with Telespark. In March, we'll have a couple of days during spring, it is March, so in two weeks, we have a couple of days at working with Telespark, and we're gonna do some education outreach about glaciers and sea level rise, and we'll do that again in April. And I've started a discussion with Spark about whether or not we, that Spark runs um, summer school camp, pro, summer camp programs for students, and I'd really like to see an Arctic summer camp that focuses on, and it could be any number of things. We've talked about different kinds of Arctic science, but also maybe one that's a, like a culture camp where students would learn about Arctic cultures and get involved in producing different kinds of things. They do amazing stuff over there. They had a summer camp where they built go-karts so I figure we could have a summer camp where we build kayaks. So uh, this is a, we're seeing this as a really long-term partnership here in Calgary. Um, we have our Aurora Borealis a Citizen Science Program, and there's a, there's a Calgary School component to that, and we're gonna re-up our participation in the Calgary Youth Science Fair starting this year. And I think we'll, we'll do the glacier thing there as well. So TELUS is gonna build our glaciers for us, so that's great. Public engagement. So we have all of these things that we do. We have our lecture series. We've started having a regular open house at the research station. We invite everybody and anybody. So First Nations, government of Yukon, general public, whoever. Um, we have some talks, some science talks. We feed everybody. We have a party. It's great. And we're going to keep doing that, and we hope that it will grow. Um, obviously, we have our outreach program. Uh, one of the things we're going to do with TELUS now is they have adult-only nights once a month where they have a specific science topic, there's wine, there's cheese, and we hope to do a couple of, uh, at least maybe one a year, an Arctic um, themed adult only night. And then I've been sort of on the, like the talk show circuit, <laughs> um, talking about the Institute and trying to raise public awareness. So one of the things, yeah, yes, what I was doing the last two days was at the Arctic Oil and Gas Symposium um, and talking to the people there about what our Institute does and what we could do in the future. Um, going to the petroleum club sometime in spring and, and such a thing. Um, but this is something that we're just starting the planning for. In fact, we'll have a first meeting about this on Friday. We would like to have a virtual institute. So we have our real institute, but we like all of our holdings to be available. And I mentioned this earlier. And that is going to require some major grant writing activities. And we're looking at building a partnership um, with um, some of these guys here. And actually, why is this on here? It's a special event. That's why I put that on there. <laughs> We're going to have more special events. We had a special event right before Christmas. So um, we are looking at putting up forward, I think, a proposal on the order of several million dollars in the next year or two to build a, a virtual institute so that you could come, walk through the halls of the research station, go up on the glacier, walk through our art collection. And that's a big partnership that will take some time to build and will require private sector as well as um, uh, a number of other partners. And then northern residents. This is important. And this is something we have to work with northern peoples on together. But broadly speaking, what we want to be able to do is to provide resources for information for northern peoples that they can access easily, that are accurate, that are constructive, and that are relevant to the things that they want to learn about, whether that's piece of art or wildlife disease, for example. Um, and we need to work in partnership to develop these resources with people who, who actually want to access them and use them. And I also see that part of this is the co-development of research activities. So I mentioned our station and how we'd like to develop an environmental monitoring program. We need to do that in collaboration with the First Nations that, um, that whose land we occupy. <laughs> um, and then I see broadening our partnership with science educators in the north, particularly Yukon College, and then NWT, and then into Nunavut. I think start in the Western Arctic and move east unless some great opportunities come up first. And the big goal here, at least 
with our respect to where we have our physical footprint on the ground is to build a public outreach and information center at the research station. It doesn't have to be big, but it has to facilitate um, the tourists that come in and want to know what's going on. It should provide some educational resources so that we can run programming, whether it's for school kids or the general public, and also allow us to, to increase our training opportunities, whether those are scientific training opportunities or safety or whatever. And this is another big ticket expensive item. But it's th this and our virtual institute are sort of my next two priorities now that the research station, some of the major things at the research station are underway. National engagement. Right. Quickly, we have a number of national partnerships with the Canadian Network of Northern Research Operators and we've put in major proposal right now to build new infrastructure, to support infrastructure at our station and partner stations across Canada. We have a partnership developing with the University of Manitoba to build a uh, Churchill Marine Observatory. We're a small partner in that, but um, probably an important one, I hope. We have a partnership with the Canadian Polar Data Catalog, which makes metadata and other information available across the country. And so those are sort of our partnerships for fulfilling our dissemination of information and basic research activities. We have new partnerships with Environment Canada to take a hard look at environmental monitoring and information sharing and how it's done out of stations. And also I see this is something we're working with the private sector on as well um, to make private sector data, environmental data more publicly available. And our educational partnerships are, are diverse. We have our scholarship program. We partner with the Association of Canadian Universities for Northern Studies. We're having a discussion, I should say I am, having a discussion with ArcticNet about how we can leverage some of their op educational opportunities and a growing partnership with the Canadian Polar Commission on some of these other activities. Internationally, I'm going to stop really soon. Internationally, um, I want to talk a little bit about the U.S. Corporation. Um, there is an Arctic Institute of North America, U.S. Corporation. It sits at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's been... Um, very quiet for many years, but just last month, the University of Alaska came forward and put some money on the table, and they've hired, they've hired somebody um, to be the executive secretary for the U.S. ANA Corporation, and so we've started our discussions with them about what we can do together. The first and easiest thing we're going to do is revive the Arctic Roundtable series, which runs out of Fairbanks but brings people in from around the world um, to talk and address specific issues. The second thing we're going to start working on is a cooperative agreement between the University of Calgary and the University of Alaska Fairbanks that would allow for exchange of students, exchange of faculty, sharing of research infrastructure. We used to have one of these with them and it went away and so we're going to breathe some new life into that. And finally, because we are both nonprofit entities, we can work together and apply for funding for initiatives collaboratively and so that's another discussion that we started to have. So the executive secretary there is, um, has started and um, he'll be coming here I think sometime in the spring and um, we'll have some, uh, some announcements about that. Um, but he'll sit in Fairbanks. We have our international partnerships with Interact which I mentioned allows us to bring international scientists to our station. But it goes beyond that so we've started cooperating on proposals. So they cooperated with us on our proposal to build Arctic Connect. We're cooperating with them on their proposal to the European Union to fund their stations. Um, we're also cooperating on things like building complementary environmental monitoring programs. We have ISAC. Thanks to one of our research associates who's not here today, we have a very strong connection to Arctic Council and we're hoping to, um, to grow that. Um, Mary Stapleton has been an observer, a permanent observer at Arctic Council, virtually impossible to come by these days. And so we um, are, are really excited about that and the opportunities as it presents to us as a national institution to have some um, in growing say in, uh, um, with activities of Arctic Council. And as I mentioned through ISAC, we're already involved in some of those things. And we're a member of the University of the Arctic. We've started looking at formal partnerships that we can have with other places like Norwegian and German institutions. Um, we put forth a bid to host the Arctic Council Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program's next workshop, which I hope happens, which would be in a year from now. That's the terrestrial working group. 
I hope that we can pull our first Arctic sy system synthesis meeting together in 2015, and I won't go on be that beyond that. And I would really like to bring a joint meeting of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and the Canadian Polar Commission to the Arctic Institute sometime in the next couple of years. So that's kind of my, um, uh, a few of our goals there. Right, and then we have some indicators of are we, are we accomplishing any of this. But I want to stop now because um, I, what I'd really like to do is answer any questions or open, the, open this up to discussion. I'm we, I think, all feel really flexible about, about the things that we can do and, and should do. And I will have a, a written document that we'll make available to everybody to, to comment on as well. But I'll take some questions now because I'm finished. Oh, wait, wait, before I do that, I have a little reminder. Ah, shoot, I had to remind myself, don't forget to introduce our staff, which I really want to do because nothing that we do could happen without them. So first, I'd like to introduce Lynn and Linda Howard, who are our information analysts for ASTIS, and Shannon Vossipal, who's our data, who's increasingly becoming our data manager and is the ASTIS manager. Mary Lee, who's our office um, manager and makes sure that I don't spend too much money, which I think I just spent a whole bunch today. Um, Karen McCullough, who's been the editor of our journal Arctic for many years. And yeah. <laughs> Melanie Paulson, without whom I would be nothing. Melanie is our administrative assistant. Um, I'd also like to introduce our newest addition, um, and that's uh, Vinay Rajev, who just has jo joined us as a research associate. Yay. And then in Yukon, we have our station managers, Shan Williams and Lance Goodwin, who look after all of our practical things. And starting in May, we'll be bringing on Mike Schmidt, formerly Canadian Geological Survey, to help us develop our station ANA-led based science program. And so we're really excited about that. Mike has worked in Yukon and around our station for about 30 years. And so he knows the territory and he knows the equipment, and we're really, that's, that's great. That's the first time I think you'll have had a station-based scientist out of our institute. So we might go broke, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> okay, so I'm happy now to answer any questions or comments or... I think we should do, yeah, I mean, I think that's the goal, right? When, we, when I first went to Alaska, they were still going. Carl Benson had organized them. And they were good because they were usually topical with a panel and panel discussion and a big audience. And I, I see no reason why we can't stream those through our site. They have the facilities to make that happen in Fairbanks. And that would be a logical thing to do. Yeah. Uh, So we're in the milepost, which is the, for all those of you who've ever driven the Alaska Highway, the milepost tells you mile by mile by mile what you'll find. And our station is in the milepost. There is nothing at the Tourist Information Center right now, partly because we don't have much to show people yet. But we do get people dropping in because they've discovered us on milepost. And um, we need to develop that more fully. But, and we have a sign <laughs> on the side of the highway. But it's not enough. It is. So we had a big chunk of our budget restored by the university. Um, uh, Mary, on the order of like 150,000. Uh, what happened is the university took up some expenses that normally came out of our operating budget on the order of quite a lot of money. So that has freed up some. And then when I came on as director, I was given by the VPR's office a, quite a substantial chunk of money to build new initiatives. So we have around $340,000 for new initiatives. 
So some of the stuff that we're starting at the station this summer will come out of that, and others for leveraging. Um, I think we have to do it through a combination of things, grants, contracts, private sector. And well, I've been, I'm actually have been working with the chair of our board to develop a private sector <coughs> fundraising strategy. The thing with the private sector is it's generally project specific rather than basic operations. So I think for things like our virtual institute or digitizing our art collection, that is a place we can get money from foundations or private sector for. But day-to-day -day operations, we have to generate that money through some, I would hope we can, in two or three, two years time, I would be really well positioned to argue for an increase in our general operating budget. And to do that, we have to start bringing in some more money. So it's, I'm a, I'm a fundraiser now. <laughs> Thank you.